Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. I'd like to welcome you all. Um, today, the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department of the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science is pleased to host the third in a series of three distinguished lectures in computer science sponsored by the Deloitte Foundation. The Deloitte Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization, has been a strong supporter of higher education for more than 86 years. The foundation supports education through a variety of initiatives that help develop the talent of the future and their influencers and promote excellence in teaching, research, and curriculum innovation. Northwestern University and DECS in particular are grateful for the foundation's support of this three-part lecture series. I would like to single out and thank 1978 McCormick alum and McCormick Advisory Council Chairman Ken Porello, who is sitting here. Um, thank you. Ken is a se senior principal at Deloitte Consulting. Um, through the division of, through the vision of Ken and the Deloitte Foundation representatives here today, Aaron, um, this lecture series came to be. We're very grateful for that. So I'm pleased now to turn the podium over to Professor Robbie Findler, who will introduce our speaker, Professor John Hughes of Chalmers University of Technology. So uh, thanks very much, John, for coming. Um, I want to take a minute and just tell you a little bit about John. Uh, John is one of the co-inventors of Haskell. Have you heard of the programming language Haskell? Yeah? So it's the most popular programming language that was developed in academia. Okay, so, and, uh, so Racket, some of you heard of Racket. Racket is like, a, just for comparison, a distant third, basically, to Haskell, which is, yeah, okay. And, so, so um, John, John was a, was a co-inventor of Haskell, and then he also wrote um, a very influential essay called Why Functional Programming Matters. Functional programming is kind of the style, or the, I don't know, style might be the wrong word, a way of thinking about programming languages that the programming language research community mainly does. And this essay really shaped the way people think about programming languages and shaped the way people um, did research and thought about what was important about programming languages. And so, so at this point, John had basically won academia. And so, so, so he did what I think any one of us would have done at that point, which is he started, um, founded a, a company in industry um, to, do, to do random testing. So he's going to tell us more about that now. And so thank you very much for coming, John. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about um, a testing tool that I've been working with for about 15 years now. And I often talk about it to uh, industrial software developers at uh, industry conferences. And when I do that, I like to start by asking my audience a question. Now, we're in a university, but still, I'll, I'll ask you the same question and see what the answer is. So here's the question. Who really, really loves testing? I have two people who, uh, who agree with me. And actually, your, your response isn't that different to the response that I get in industry conferences. For most people, testing is not something that they rush into work looking forward to doing. Rather, it's a chore that you have to do in order to develop software. But it's not something that many people see as fun. So why is that? Why does testing feel hard. Well, I want you to imagine now that um, you're developing a piece of software uh, with n different features, and you need to write a test suite for it. What are you going to do? You're probably going to write three or four test cases per feature. That's kind of, you know, good practice. And that's OK, isn't it? That's a linear amount of work. No problem. But we all know that if you do that, you won't find all of your bugs. Because some bugs only appear when you use pairs of features in combination. So suppose you were to try to write a test suite that would test for all possible pairs of features. Well, that's a quadratic amount of work. And depending on how large n is, it might be doable, but hmm, it's not so great. And you know what? Even so, you won't find all the bugs. Because some only appear when you use three features in combination. And now if you imagine testing for all of these combinations, you've got to do a cubic amount of work. And really, for quite small n, this is beginning to be unreasonably much work. And this is before we even start talking about race conditions, 
which are errors that won't even appear every time you run a test. So, you know, at this point, testing becomes hair-tearingly difficult. No wonder people don't enjoy doing it. You can't, you can never test enough. You can't test everything. So how on, ever, how on earth are you going to know when to stop? Well, what's the answer? It's obvious, really. Don't write tests. <laughs> Generate them. And that's what this talk is about. Quick check, the tool I'm talking about, is something that uh, Kuhn Glassen and I came up with back in 1999, actually, for Haskell. And um, then about seven years later, I started Cubic, and we marketed a version of Quick Check for Erlang. And since then, we've made lots and lots of extensions, and we found lots of interesting bugs for customers like Ericsson and Volvo Cars and Basho and so on. And I'm going to tell you about some of those, some of those bugs. But what does Quick Check do? Well, most commonly, we have some API that we want to test, and we generate random sequences of API calls. And we run them, and we keep doing that until a test fails. Now, when a test fails in this setting, it's not usually because of every single call in this sequence. Usually, there are just a few critical calls that were responsible for the failure. So the next thing that QuickCheck does is to try and extract those essential calls and distill the test case down to a minimal failing example. And that's what we then use as a starting point for debugging. I'm going to show you an example of testing some code like this. And um, the code I'm going to test is a circular buffer in C. So it's an implementation of a queue as a circular buffer. Let me find my code here. And now I'll need to make sure that you can see my screen. OK. And this, that is the wrong Emacs, I think. Oh. Lovely. No, I uh, had the wrong thing on the screen. There we are. So this is um, some C code. It's an implementation of a queue. So the queue has a pointer to a buffer area where integers are stored. And um, there's the next index where I'm going to put something in, the index where I'm going to take something out, the size of the buffer. It's obvious code. Here is um, the code for allocating a queue. We've got to allocate memory for the buffer area. We've got to initialize it, allocate memory for the struct, initialize that, and return a pointer. Um, Here's how we put something into the queue. We write the buffer at the input pointer. We increment the input index modulo the size. How do we take things out? We read from the buffer at the output pointer, and we increment the output pointer modulo the size. And I've also got a little function here to tell me how many things are in the queue. Um, so this just takes the difference between those indices modulo the size. So it's very simple code. It's obviously correct, but it's just an, a little example for testing. So I'm going to test this using Quick Check. Um, first of all, I need to be able to test the C code. Uh, and I'm going to do so by invoking it from the Erlang redeval print loop. So let me just um, compile that C code. There we are. That's compiling the C code and making it callable from Erlang. And uh, let's, let's create a queue with space for five entries. That returns a pointer to that address. Um, let's put something into it. I'll put in a 1. I'll put in a 2. Let's ask how many things are in the queue. 2, of course. Um, let's take something out. We get the 1. We get the 2. We get uninitialized memory, just as you would expect, and so on. There's the 1 again. It's a circular buffer. There's the 2 again and so on. So it's behaving exactly as you would expect. As you can see, it's correct code. <laughs> so will this come back to my slide? Yes. So how do we test this kind of code? Well, I said I'm going to generate sequences of API calls. But then I have to have a way of telling whether or not the test has passed. 
And we do that normally by modeling the state of the system. So for every API call, we define a model state and a model state transition function that specifies how the model state changes. So that means that the model knows what should be happening inside the code under test at each point. And then we just write some post conditions that compare the actual result from the real C code to the model state. And all of this modeling code, uh, in this version of the tool, it's written in Erlang. So we take advantage of functional programming for writing what is the specification of the code. And I'm testing C code, but that doesn't matter. So in this particular instance, a test case might do something like this. We'll put a 1, put a 2, do a get. Put a 3, do another get. And I can model the queue more or less just by recording the list of things that should be in it. So after putting a 1, there should be a 1 in the queue. After putting a 2, there should be 1 and 2. And then the post condition will just check that when I call get, the result was the first thing in the queue before the call. I'm not going to go through the code in detail, but here are some fragments. So for each operation, we, def we specify it via a number of simple functions, um, a precondition function. This says you can call get if the pointer is not undefined. That is, if you've called new, so if there is a queue. Um, and the contents of the queue should not be empty. So I'm not going to generate tests that read the uninitialized data, because I think they're not very interesting. We have the state transition function that I mentioned. So this says that when you call get, uh, the contents of the queue is replaced by the tail of the list, everything except the first element. And we write a post condition that says that the result of get should be equal to the first element of the list of contents. And we write functions of this sort for each operation. And then we just generate tests. So let's do so. OK. Um, right, and I have to do the same thing again to make sure that you can see my screen. Yes, it came back. Okay. So, what I will do now is call quick check. Um, oh, no, uh, what I will do now is compile the specification. And then I will call quick check. to generate tests for the queue. OK. So Quick Check has generated a lot of tests at random. And uh, one of them has failed. And you can see, if I go back here, this is the random test that failed. And then this is a slightly more readable representation of what happened. And you can see that it's very complicated. You wouldn't want to debug that. But then QuickCheck started shrinking the test case. And we ended up with this. So this is the part of the screen that I want you to look at. This shows what went wrong. What happened? We created a new queue of size 1. We put a 0 into it. Then we put a 1 into it. And then we called get. So I've put in 0 and 1. I call get, what should I see? Zero, obviously. And what did get return? One. So I got the wrong result from get. And there's a little bit more explanation down here. It says a post condition failed because one was not equal to zero. So I want you to put on your debugging hats now. And look at this, this test case. You can see what happened. What's the problem? The queue size is one. Yes, and then I put two things into it. So what happened is that the one overwrote the zero. And so when I called get, there's only the one in the queue. So of course, that's what I saw. So what I've done here is I've abused the, the API. So here's a question for you now. Where is the fault? Is it in the C code or is it in the test? Who thinks it's in the C code? And who thinks it's in the test? 
okay, there's a small majority for in the test, and I'm on that side, so that's the one that wins. <laughs> so, of course, we could take different views here. We could say that the C code should do something more sensible when I put two things in. But um, this C code, it's supposed to be brittle. Okay, I mean, that's, that's the C tradition. <laughs> so, um, in fact, I'm going to take the view that I shouldn't do this. You shouldn't put more things than will fit into a queue. And uh, so there ought to be a precondition that prevents this. Let's look at the code. OK, um, if I go to the model, then we can look at the precondition for put. Here it is. Oh, look, all it says is that the Q pointer should not be undefined. There should be a Q. But of course, it should also say that um, there should be space in the Q. So the length of the contents of the Q should be less than the maximum size. OK, so let me strengthen the precondition like this. And if I do that and now recompile my spec, then I'll just rerun that last test, and we'll see what happens now. Because if, if it's equal to the size, then the, the queue is full, and you shouldn't call put. Yeah. So the test still fails, but now it says the precondition failed. And that's what I want. So this test case will no longer be generated. It's excluded by my new precondition. And now if I rerun the tests, we see a lot of dots. By default, QuickCheck runs 100 tests, and it prints a dot for each one that passes, so things are looking good. Actually, for simplicity, um, I had commented out the model for the size function. So let's uncomment that. So we have, we've not been testing size so far. And indeed, we get some statistics here. We can see that we've been calling put and get and new, but not size. So let's add size to the mix. So if I recompile my model and rerun my tests, oh, they don't work. OK. So once again, this is the part I want you to look at. Whoops. OK, I'm not managing to color the right part. I think you know which part I mean. So let's see what happened. I created a queue of size 1, and I got this pointer back. I put 0 into it. Well, that was OK. And then I asked, what's the size? OK, what should the size be? 1. And size returned 0. OK, there's a fault. Is it in the C code or in the test? The C code this time. This can't be right. I put something in, and it tells me that there's 0 elements in the queue. So let's look at the C code. OK, we'll switch back to the C. So here's the size function, right? I'm taking the difference between those indices, modulo the size. What's the size? It's 1. Wait a minute. Everything modulo 1 is 0. This function can only return 0 when I have a Q of size 1. What? Why didn't it shrink more? Because if you don't do the put, it's correct for size to return 0. You need the put to exhibit the bug. Right? So it's a minimal counterexample, remember. Everything in that counterexample is essential to provoking the bug. That's why in the first one, we put 0 and 1. You have to put two different values in order to notice when one overwrites the other. And 0 and 1 are the smallest two different integers. So yeah, so what's going on here? If you think about it, this bug also appears in the put function, where I incremented the input pointer modulo size. So I had an input pointer at position 0. I put one thing in, modulo 1. So it wrapped around right back to the beginning. So my full queue. It looks exactly the same as the empty one. And actually, this isn't just a problem for queues of size 1. It's a problem for queues of any size, that when I fill them up completely, 
the input pointer wraps around. A full queue looks the same as an empty queue. So my representation is inadequate. I've got to change it somehow. So what shall I do? How shall I fix this? Well, I could put a Boolean into the struct to record whether the queue is full or empty. That would be a horrible solution. I'd have special cases throughout my code. But, so let me show you a hack, a beautiful hack. When I am asked to create a queue of size n, I will actually create a queue of size n plus 1. What does this mean? It means, because there's only a problem when the queue is full, so to see the bug, the client has to put n plus 1 things into a queue of size n. What does that mean? It means it's their fault. I escape blame, the goal of all good software engineering. So let, let's try that. Did I save it? I think I did. Uh, I'll have to recompile the C code this time. Where's the call for that? Here it is. And um, now I will just uh, rerun that same test. It passes now. And so now we fix it, of course, so it should be working. Let's run some random tests to make sure. Oh, no. It still doesn't work. OK. Look at this. I want you to de debug this for me now. I created a queue of size 1. That's really 2. I put a 0 into it. So now it's full. I can't put anything else. But I can call get and take that 0 out. Now I can put another 0 in. How many things are in the queue? 1. And I call size, and I get minus 1. OK, I suspect the C code. What on earth has happened here? Well, if we just work through the code and we keep this example in mind, I created a queue of size 1. That's really 2. My input pointer was 0 at the beginning. I put one thing in, so that increments it to 1. When I do the second put, that increments it to 2 that wraps around back to 0. And I've done one get, so my other pointer <coughs> is going to be a 1. So if I look at the size function, Right. I'm taking input pointer, which will be 0, minus 1. So that's minus 1. But I'm taking it modulo the size, which is 2. What is minus 1 modulo 2? It's plus 1, right? The correct answer. Let's just make sure. If I go back to Erlang, and I take minus 1 modulo 2, minus 1? How come? Erlang doesn't implement modulo. It implements remainder. So basically, division rounds towards 0. And as a result, remainders can be negative. C does the same thing. So that's the problem. Uh, if this expression is negative, I'm going to get the wrong answer. So I've got to make sure that that expression is never negative. How can I do that? OK, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so usually, the suggestion I get at this point is, what? Add. Add. Can you add a full queue? Yes, I could do that. And I will. But first, I'm going to fix it the wrong way, which is to take the absolute value. So many audiences suggest absolute value. You didn't, but you can't win them all. So, so let's try this. OK, um, I'll recompile the C code. And I will rerun that last test, and it passes. No problem. So, um, so now let's think about what I've done. I provoked a, a slightly subtle bug in the code. I created a test case that demonstrates the bug. I've changed my code. The test passes. All my tests are green. I'm done, right? Shall I run some more random ones? Let's. Just, just for fun. Oh, no, it still doesn't work. So what, what's happening now? I'm creating a queue of size 2. That's progress. 
Cues of size one work now. I create a queue of size two, that's really three. I put three things into it, the input pointer wraps around. I take one thing out, the output pointer is one. There should be two things in the queue, size returns one. And it's because I'm taking, I should be taking minus one modulo three, which is plus two, but instead I'm taking the absolute value, which gives me plus one. So this was the wrong thing to do, and the right thing to do would be to add the size of the queue there. And that will guarantee that the expression is positive without changing its value modulo size. So this should be the right fix. Let's recompile the C. And once again, I'll just rerun the last test. That one passes. And I'll run some random tests. 100, 200, 300. OK, 500 tests say it works, so I'm happy. OK, so there we are. That was a demo showing how we can test uh, a little bit of imperative code with quick check. So what can we learn from that? Well, one interesting thing is that the same property, the same model, can find many different bugs. And that's something that we see again and again in much larger examples than this. And secondly, I hope you'll agree that diagnosing the problems was quite easy once we had those minimal failing tests. We think of the shrinking process as like extracting the signal from the noise. Random tests contain a lot of junk. That is their purpose. And that's why they're good at provoking faults in the first place. But you don't want to try and diagnose a problem from a test that is doing lots of irrelevant stuff. The shrinking process extracts the signal, and it results in something that is much, much easier to diagnose. So, so far, you might wonder, well, will this really scale up? I've shown you a tiny, tiny example. My model was actually larger than the C code in this case. If that were true in general, it wouldn't really be a useful technique. So let me tell you about the largest project we've done so far, which is testing um, the Autosar basic software for Volvo cars. So this software is it's like the operating system that runs on every processor in a car, of which there are about 100 nowadays in a modern car. And you can see that it contains an Ethernet stack. Um, the CAN bus is a network that is very commonly used in cars. Lin and Flexray are also used. Comm services provide some routing. And then the diagnostic cluster keeps track of faults that occur while you're driving and reports them to the service station when you take your car in to be fixed. So this software needs to run on every processor in the car. And obviously, if the processors are to be able to talk to each other, then it's got to be implemented in a compatible way on all of the processors. So you might think the obvious thing to do would be to create a kind of open source Linux-like implementation that everybody would use. And then, you know, the processors would just talk to each other. That might be the obvious thing to do. It's not what the car industry has done. Instead, they've standardized the behavior of each of these components, and there are many competing suppliers who claim to implement the standard. But if you've got software from two different suppliers in the car, and it doesn't manage to talk to each other, then the manufacturer, like Volvo Cars, has to figure out who's at fault. And there, there's a big integration problem. When you first put a car together, it's not a question of can you drive it. You can't even boot it normally. The theory is that car manufacturers should be able to buy code from different providers and just have everything work seamlessly together. That's the point of the standard. But it doesn't happen in practice. So we have developed models uh, using QuickCheck for um, many components in the basic software. And uh, we've used them to find lots of errors in, uh, in, the, in the code. Most of the bugs we can't talk about. But I can show you this one. This is a bug in a CAN bus stack. So to understand this, you need to know that messages on the CAN bus, they have a message ID, which is also the priority for the bus. So here we send a message with priority one, the top priority. And we can see that it was sent. The next calls in the test case send messages with priority two and three. They're lower priority than one. The smaller the number, the higher the priority. But the bus is busy. So 
those messages have to be queued up by the CAN bus stack. Then the last call in the test case confirms transmission of the one, and it says the bus is now available, which means that the stack can now send the next message. Which message should it send? Priority two. Which message did it send? Priority three. OK. So what's going on here? Well, we actually had the source code of this um, CAN bus stack, and so we were able to debug it. And we discovered that the cause was that CAN identifiers, originally in the first version of the standard, were only 11 bits, which means you can only have 2,000 different message types in the entire car. And as you will realize, that's just not enough for a, a modern software system. So there's a new version of the standard that also allows an extended CAN ID with this 29 bits available for this identifier. And you can mix and match in the same system. You can either use a standard ID or an extended one. What matters is the value. So, you know, number one as standard has higher priority than number two as extended and vice versa. When you send a message, though, you need to know what format to construct. And so you need to know whether your ID is extended or not. So in this particular CAN stack, the CAN ID was always stored in an unsigned 32-bit integer with the top bit set to 1 if it was extended. So what does that mean? That means when you compare CAN IDs to decide which methods to send, you must mask off that top bit. Somebody forgot to do that. And in this example, I didn't show you before, but the message with priority 2 had an extended CAN ID. So it was treated as priority 2 to the 31 plus 2. And that's why it was sent after the one with priority 3. So that was the problem. So what do we see here? We see a much more complex system, but there's a very low-level bug involving failing to mask off a bit. Nevertheless, there's a short test case that can provoke the bug, and we could find that short test case by generating random ones and shrinking them using exactly the same technique that I showed you for the queue. So does it scale? Yes, it scales. Uh, I also like this bug because um, it's really quite important. Those priorities are there for a reason. Everything in the car talks on the CAN bus, the stereo, the brakes. Here's a tip. Don't adjust the volume during emergency braking. <laughs> so we found many, many bugs of this sort. We took 3,000 pages of PDF. That, that was the, the standard documents they, that we had to work from. We turned those into about 20,000 lines of quick check models. We tested in total about a million lines of C code from six different suppliers. And we found more than 200 problems, of which more than 100 were actually problems in the standard itself. I found one where there was a requirement in the standard that said one thing, and then a paragraph explaining what it meant that directly contradicted. I mean, what do you expect? It's just a document. It's written by people. It hasn't been tested. Of course, it's full of errors. And in a few cases, we were able to compare our test models to existing test code. And our models were 10 times shorter and test more. So yeah, this is a good result. How am I doing for time, Robbie? OK, good. So I want to uh, tell one last story. And this story starts with a message to the Erlang mailing list in 2007. We know there's a lurking bug somewhere in the depths code. We got bad object and premature end of file every other month for last year. But we haven't been able to track the bug down because the file's repaired automatically next time it's opened. This was a message from a guy called Tupper Turnquist at Klarna. OK, so I'm sure we can all feel Tupper's pain. But what's the context? Klarna, where a Swedish startup to provide invoicing services for web shops. When I heard that, I thought, what's wrong with credit cards? Why do you need invoices? But actually, there are many people who don't want to give their credit card number to an untrusted web shop. And it turned out to be a brilliant business idea. There are more than 1,000 people nowadays. They're the biggest operator in Europe and um, expanding into the US, I believe, soon. So they, they were a hugely successful startup. And they built their application in Erlang, and they used the Manesia database that comes with Erlang. 
And that provides distribution and transactions and replication and lots of good stuff. But it needs a back end for storing the data. If you store data on disk, that back end is a component called debts. It stores a collection of tuples in a file. And debts is the, the component that was failing there. And when I heard about this, I thought, hmm, it's failing every month. That sounds as though it might be a race condition. I was interested in race conditions at the time. So I thought, let's see if we can track it down with QuickCheck. So to tell you this story, I need to explain how we test for race conditions using QuickCheck. And I'm going to take a very simple example. We're going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Do you recognize this? OK, my drawing is clear enough. OK, good. So the kind of thing you get in a bakery. You take a ticket, and then that determines your turn for service. So suppose I were to uh, try and model this in Erlang. <coughs> well, I'd need to define a function for taking a ticket. Anything else? Well, every now and then, the roll of tickets runs out. So let's have a reset as well. And that represents replacing the roll of tickets. And now I could write a unit test uh, in Erlang like this. What I'm doing is performing a sequence of calls, resetting it, taking a ticket three times. And in each case, I'm matching the result against the expected value. OK, here is a constant in Erlang. Um, it's like void in C. 1, 2, and 3 are the expected values from taking a ticket, and so on. So that, that's very simple. And that also illustrates to you how the dispenser is supposed to behave. This is also very representative of the way that people write real test suites in industry. You make a sequence of calls, and you know what the result should be, so you just check that you get the expected result. It's also very easy to model this system with QuickCheck. I might generate a test case that does a reset and three takes. How can I model the state of the dispenser? Hmm, an integer, perhaps. So I can just model it by the you know, zero initially and then in increment it by each take. And then the post condition will just check that take returns one more than the state when it was invoked. So I can easily test this stuff, both with handwritten test cases and with generated tests. But I would not be satisfied with these tests. Why? Because the whole point of a ticket dispenser is to regulate the flow of a lot of concurrent customers to one bakery counter. So if I only run sequential tests, then I'm failing to test a very important part of its behavior. What I want to do is run tests something like this. This is supposed to represent, first of all, resetting the dispenser. And then here's one customer who takes two tickets for some reason and another customer who takes one. And these two will run in parallel. But now I've, I've got a problem. What are the expected results here? Well, it depends. I might get these results where this customer got tickets one and two. Or I might get these results where this customer leapt in between this, this customer's two attempts to take a ticket and got ticket number two so that this guy got ticket number three. That's not wrong. It might be a bit rude, but it's not wrong. What I should not see is something like this, where both customers get ticket number one. So there's a problem here in that there are actually three possible correct outcomes, depending on which ticket this customer gets. So if you want to write tests uh, in the traditional style, what are you going to do? Well, in this case, you could collect the results and then check that you get one of these three possible outcomes. But that doesn't scale. This is a very small test. I actually want to run much more interesting tests, like this one. How many correct outcomes are there from this test? It turns out there's 30 possibilities. And nobody in their right minds would try to enumerate all 30 when writing a test. Anybody who did would get at least one of them wrong. So uh, the, the traditional method of writing tests just does not work for parallel tests. On the other hand, we can use our quick check model to test this kind of system. So I would claim uh, this test represents the first test I showed you, but it's drawn on its side. So first of all, a reset, and then one customer who takes two tickets and another who takes one. I would claim that if this customer gets tickets one and three, and this customer gets ticket two, that represents a successful test. Why do I say that? Because 
there is an order in which I could have performed those calls such that it would match the model. Okay? So I can decide whether a test has passed or failed by simply exploring all possible orders and seeing, is there a way that I can explain these results using my sequential model? And if so, we say the test passes. If not, we'll say it fails. I have the dispenser here. Let us switch back to my screen so you can see it. OK. And I'll just make sure that I've compiled it. Now, I'm going to, first of all, run some sequential tests of the dispenser. So it's important to do this. This checks that um, the model that I've written matches the implementation. And it does. So these will all pass. OK, so sequential tests pass. Let's run some parallel ones. Whoa, a test failed. What happened? Well, here we just did two things in parallel. Both calls of take ticket. And they both returned one. And there's no possible interleaving that can explain that. And indeed, it's the, it's the problem that I discussed. That this is what we don't want to happen. If I just run that again, watch. I'm getting different random tests initially. But see, that minimal test case is always the same. So we are able to provoke this race condition very, very easily. And we're able to shrink it to the minimal example very, very reliably. That was what I wanted to show you there. So um, come back to my slides. OK. So here's the test case that failed. Here is my implementation of take ticket. I'm reading a global variable and then writing m plus 1 to it. Wait a minute. That's a critical region. Where is the synchronization? There isn't any. So I made a very stupid implementation of take ticket. Of course, it doesn't work in parallel. Um, but that, the point is not that we found a very subtle race condition here. We haven't. We found a very obvious race condition, but we can find it very reliably, and we can shrink it to the minimal example very consistently. So I took the same technique, and I applied it to debts. What does debts do? It's a tuple store. It stores tuples in a file. Erlang tuples look like this. They've got curly brackets. The first component is a key, and the rest are values. And the API won't surprise you at all. You can insert a list of tuples into a table. You can delete all the tuples with a given key from the table. Insert new is just like insert, except that if any of the keys is already present, then it's a no-op. And there's some more. It won't surprise you at all. And how can I model debts? Well, it's almost enough just to say, let's keep track in the model of the list of tuples that should be in the file. And that's easy to do. So my specification of the core of the API was less than 100 lines of code, which compares pretty well to the implementation that is more than 6,000 spread across four different modules, keeping hash tables on disk and all kinds of stuff. So I got this. I wrote my specification. I ran sequential tests. Good thing I did, because my initial expectations were slightly wrong about how it behaved. But I finally got a model that matched the sequential behavior perfectly. And then I started running parallel tests. And straight away, one of them failed. OK, I don't know if you can see what's wrong with this. What did we do? Well, I opened the file in the prefix. That's not a surprise. And then I did two things in parallel. One of them inserted an empty list of tuples. That's a no-op, and it was OK. The other one did use insert new to insert an empty list of tuples. That's also a no-op, and that returned OK. And QuickCheck says, there's no possible interleaving of these calls that can explain these results. That seems really weird. What on earth is the problem? They both returned OK. Sometimes there's no alternative. You just have to read the manual. Here's what it says about insert new. Look at the result type. Even in Erlang, a bool is either true or false. It's not OK. So I run tens of thousands of sequential tests and insert new, return true or false every time. 
Now I run a parallel one, and suddenly it returns OK. What's going on? Well, OK, so it's a bug. Uh, not super serious, perhaps. But I continued testing, and I quickly found another one. What's happening here? Well, here, um, I open the file, and now here I'm, I'm inserting a tuple, 0, 0, and I'm in inserting new of a tuple, the same tuple, 0, 0. So <coughs> if the insert new goes first, it should succeed and return true. If it goes second, it should fail and return false. But it shouldn't time out. And we shouldn't see an error message saying, debts, bug was found when accessing ta debts table. So I thought, OK, that's certainly a bug. So at this point, I thought, insert new just doesn't work. And I disabled insert new from my tests, because I wanted to see if there were any other bugs I could find. And when I did that, I found this one. OK, what's happening here? Well, first of all, we open the file. And then we do two things in parallel. Now, one of the things we do is open the file again. You might think that's a little strange. But this database is designed for use in Erlang, in highly concurrent systems. We expect thousands of processes to be using the database at the same time, and all of them have to make sure it's open. So it's perfectly OK for one process to be opening the file while another one is using it. What's happening to the one that uses it? Well, it's inserting 0, 0, and that's OK. And then it's fetching the entire contents of the database. And it was empty. But I just put 0, 0 in there, and it's gone. So I found this bug in a number of forms, where if one process is opening the table, another one can see a sequentially inconsistent version of the database contents. So that's not good. So I was very happy about finding these bugs. And I sent these test cases into the guy at Ericsson who maintains the code. And the next day, he sent me back another mail. He said, oh, I fixed them. Uh, thank you very much. Here's a new version. But I don't think these are the bugs that are occurring at Klarna, because the symptoms are different. At Klarna, the file is being corrupted. So I asked him, how can I tell if the file is corrupt? And he sent me one line of code that could detect whether or not corruption had occurred. So I just added that to my test. I ran the parallel test and then checked, is the file corrupt? And of course, my, my test says it should not be. And then I had to run tests for maybe 10 minutes or so. And I found this one. OK, look at this. What are we doing? We open the file, we close it, we open again in the prefix. And then we do three things in parallel, two insertions, and one lookup of the same key. The lookup must have gone first because it didn't find the key. And the results are all OK. Right, so um, that looks fine. But when I checked for corruption, I got premature end of file. I want to emphasize, this is the smallest test case that can provoke this bug. When I saw that, I thought, come on. Open, close, open. That can't be necessary. And so I manually removed the first open and close, and I ran the reduced test tens of thousands of times. It passed every single time. And why was that? Well, today I know when we start the test, the file does not exist. The first open creates the file, then we close it. The second open opens an existing file, empty but existing. That puts the system into a slightly different state, and that state is critical to provoke the race condition. Likewise, we really do need three things in parallel. This one goes into a queue and makes a server busy <coughs> so that the following two requests arrive in a queue together, and they were wrongly dispatched in parallel. And that was the cause of the problem. So I was pleased with that. And uh, I sent it off to the man maintaining the code next day. He sent me the fixed version. And I was very pleased with myself. And I was due to give a, a talk at a conference, a developer conference in Denmark about something else. But I thought this story is much more fun, really. And so I uh, shortened the previous talk to half its length. And I wrote a talk about this. And in order to do so, I had to rerun the test so I could copy and paste the output onto my slides. 
So I did that, and while I was testing for this one, in my hotel room in Aarhus, I found this one. What's happening here? We open the file, we insert something into it, and then in parallel, one process is reopening the file again, the other one is looking up a key that's not there, the zero, and then deleting the key one, that's the key that we inserted. And once again, all the results are consistent with the model, but when I checked for corruption, I got bad object. Here's the message to the mailing list. <coughs> we got bad object and premature end of file every other month. So it looks as though these two bugs have the right symptoms, at least, to explain the problems found at Klarna. So I sent this bug as well into the man maintaining the code. And he sent me a new version the next day with the bug fixed. That new code has gone into production at Klarna. And since it went in, some time ago, there's been one bad object exception when reading a file that was last written before the new code went into production. So it looks as though we really did nail those race conditions. Before I did this work, then a lot of effort had gone into trying to track these things down. The man working with the code had spent more than six weeks at Klarna trying to debug it. And at the end of that time, they thought, it seems to happen when the file is about one gigabyte. Maybe it's something to do with rehashing. Now we know you need a database with at most one record, and you need five or six calls, depending on which bug it is, to provoke the error. And given those minimal failing tests, it's less than a day's work to find and fix the problem. So that's really a pretty dramatic um, illustration of the value of shrinking to minimal failing tests. OK. Um, well, I think I'm approaching the end of the hour, so I, I will just skip over this a little bit and come to my summary. Don't write tests, generate them. I'll stop there for questions. Yeah, so um, I believe that the best way to use this kind of tool is to write your model first and then your implementation. But that's not what people do. Rather, they build the implementation first, and then they ask us, you know, can you help us test it? So that means the model is the new code. The model is the untested code. And the first test you run, it's the model that's going to fail. So what happens is there's a kind of process where you start off, you run your model, and you get a failure, and you think, oh, I screwed up. I'm, you know, there's a typo. Or after a while, then you start finding more, maybe more subtle problems in the model. And then you start finding problems where the model and the code are inconsistent, but you don't know which is right. And you go to the developers, and they say maybe, <coughs> oh, yes, that's what we plan to do. Or it's not, what, it's not what the documentation says, but we must document this, and so on. You have to work through those first. But once you've done so, and you've debugged the model, then you start finding the real errors. And at that point, um, at that point, the errors start to flow very, very rapidly. So I like to explain it like this. If you're writing a model for n features, or n calls, it's about the same amount of work per call. So to go from n to n plus 1 functions that you're testing, it's a constant amount of work. But you, when you go from n functions in your API to n plus 1 functions in your API, the variety of tests you can generate goes up exponentially. So once you get to that point where you're finding real errors, you, we generally work by adding one function at a time to the tests. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Then you get to a point where you get a huge number of bugs in a very short time. I've had people say to me, literally, can you please stop testing for a while so we can fix the bugs you've already found? But that was your first question. Um, so the, uh, the second question now is, um, when do you know that you're done testing? When do you know that you're done testing? I mean, for example, you, know, you, you were working on these race conditions, you thought that you have fixed the problem, and then suddenly you're in your hotel room and you find the second one, right? You could have not found it, for example. So when do you know 
when it's the right time to stop. You can never know that. I mean, that's, that's a general property of testing. And there are all kinds of answers that people use. Like, if you look at the coverage, it's useful to look at code coverage with QuickCheck as well. You can, it can show you that there are, are parts of the code that are not tested at all, for example. And then that can prompt you to change your generation so you can generate a greater variety of tests. But any method that you know, promises to tell you you've tested enough is, by definition, snake oil. I mean, Dijkstra was right about that. In practice, if I can run a million tests, and I've examined the distribution of tests, so I'm pretty sure that you know, there's a good variety, um, and if, if whenever I plant a bug deliberately, I can find it quickly, then I'll be pretty confident that the code is correct, and it usually is. code not running tends to be less around, a, less around a block of code and more around when you're integrating multiple technologies or multiple types of code, and it's the interactions between the technologies. Have you applied quick check to a diverse technology stack like that for debugging? Yes. So when we apply quick check, we're generating the same kind of tests that you could write by hand. So basically, any situation where you can do sensible testing by writing test cases by hand, you can also use QuickCheck to automate. And then you get a greater variety of tests. And uh, you know, if the kind of problem that you're talking about, it may arise if you do a particular sequence of operations, and then you get to a point where component A tries to call component B in a way that doesn't work, and <coughs> everything crashes or, or whatever. Um, so yes, I think the best example of that that I can describe would be when we were testing a radio, 3G radio base station. And uh, we found that um, during our tests, the, the base station would just go silent. And it, it, we were crashing it very, very severely. And uh, it turned out that the only way to recover from that was to reboot the base station, which took two minutes. So we had to write a quick check test that at the start of every test case rebooted the base station, waited two minutes, then ran the test, and then we would see whether or not the base station was still responsive. And of course, running random tests and waiting for them to shrink took a long time. We had a long lunch that day. But when we came back, we found a sequence of two calls to the base station that crashed it. And they were both calls to set up a signaling channel. Um, so in 3G base stations, then whenever a handset is active, there's a radio channel that's dedicated to it. But there's also a signaling channel that goes to all the handsets in a cell. Uh, and so when they're inactive, that can be used to broadcast messages to them all. So there must only be one of these channels, by definition. But you still have to set it up and configure the power and various other parameters. So there is a command that you can send the, the base station saying, start up this signaling channel. And since there's a command you can send once, you can send that command twice. Well, if you do, the base station should reject the second one and say, no, I've already got the signaling channel. But we found just the right combination of parameters that fooled the base station into setting up the channel twice, even though that should be impossible. And once you've done that, basically, it's just a matter of time the thing is going to crash. And um, we, were, we started debugging this. We were very confused because we were finding Java exceptions in the log. And we knew the base station was built with C++. <laughs> so what was going on? It, it turned out that most, most of the base station code was C++ generated from UML. But there was an operator GUI. And that was programmed in Java. And that GUI was the thing that was trying to visualize the state of the base station. Once you had two of these signaling channels, the C++ would just, yo, know, chant on, until suddenly it fell over into a quivering heap and never moved again. But the Java ran across, you know, I'm trying to visualize two things. There should only be one. And that crashed at first. So that was the, the sign. So why did I think this was relevant? Because um, 
It's a combination of technologies, an unexpected combination. We didn't even know that Java was there, mm -hmm. but we were still able to find and provoke that bug and find the Java as a result. So we start with the test case that was generated randomly. So we have something that we know fails. Right. And now if you were to imagine trying to debug that by hand, you would try taking parts of it away and seeing if it still fails. We're essentially doing the same thing. So we're doing a greedy search um, for ways to simplify the test case. Exactly how we simplify it, that, that's um, domain dependent. So there are some simplifications that are always a good idea, like removing commands from the sequence or replacing numbers by smaller ones, that's almost always a good idea. Um, but uh, there are also, you know, there, there could be examples like maybe, maybe it's worthwhile trying to simplify some tests by replacing an API call by sleeping for a while. Um, we have we've found situations where that was very helpful for shrinking. So there's a little bit of an art to it. All right, I think John has a few minutes if you want to stick around now, but maybe we should let him go for those who have to be somewhere at three. So. Let's thank Johnny.